Now, the Roman Catholic Church is Christian in outward appearance only, inwardly, and behind the Christian veneer, it is Saturnalia that is being worshipped by Roman Catholics. Saturnalia was, or is, the religion carried on down to this day, hidden within obvious outward Christian events. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is Christian in outward appearance only, inwardly, and behind the Christian veneer, it is Saturnalia that is being worshipped by Roman Catholics. Now, the Christian cross is one of those outward symbols, the cross, the cube, and the six-pointed star. Now, you will see these as the cross on which Jesus was crucified, he co-opting this satanic symbol on which in death he stripped Satan of Satan's power of death and hell and rendered him a defeated foe. Rome used the X or the cross of crucifixion to all who dared to oppose the will of Rome. It was the most fierce and threatening of the symbols of Saturnalia. This empty cross, therefore, is the centerpiece symbol of Christianity signifying the once and for all death and resurrection of Jesus, God's Messiah, and the Son of the living God. Jesus actually defeated Satan in the wilderness in Satan's temptations. Jesus stripped Satan of his power of death and hell in his crucifixion on the cross and took that symbol, empty of his body, from Satan and uses it against Satan as his victory over Satan. Now, Rome used the symbol, as did Cain and his descendants. Cain used his mark as an authority to punish anybody who would attempt to exact vengeance on him for his murder of his brother Abel. Rome used the X or the cross of crucifixion as the authority and means by which to punish anyone who would cross Rome when motivated by vengeance against Rome, which they interpreted as anyone who crossed the will of Rome in any matter. Now, in these last days, there will be those who take or receive the mark of the beast in their right hand or in their forehead. The mark of Cain on the other side of the great flood by which Jehovah God marked Cain as a warning to any who would take vengeance on Cain for the killing of his brother Abel, that any person so doing would suffer vengeance seven times over. On this side of the great flood, the mark of Cain becomes the mark of the beast. This mark identifies to the beast and his new world order government who belongs to him and identifies the person taking the mark of the beast as identifying himself with the beast as belonging to the beast. Now the Holy Spirit showed my wife that this mark of the beast is the counterfeit of God's instructions to the Hebrew children to, quote, bind, unquote, his commandments, statutes, and judgments, quote, for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, unquote. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8. Now, those of us who are Christ Jesus must be, for Jesus Christ to identify himself with us, must be sealed in our foreheads by the Holy Spirit of God. That is what is being promoted here. The sealing in our foreheads, which seal is the acceptable will of God. The good will of God is to present yourself to Jehovah God, saved by the shed blood of Jesus. The acceptable will of God is to present yourself to Jehovah God, sealed in your forehead by the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God. Now, that is done by the laying of the foundation in you by the Holy Spirit of God, the seven spirits of God, doctrine by doctrine, spirit by spirit. The blood of Jesus is poured out on your past of sin in Jesus' salvation. The blood of Jesus is sprinkled seven times, one time for each for obedience to and acceptance of each of the Spirit's teaching in the laying of the foundation doctrine. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, the six-pointed star is the symbol of the planet Saturn, which planet is called in false religion the black sun. And of course, it is the planet Saturn that is being worshipped in Saturnalia. The planet Saturn is, was, worshipped as the black sun. In ancient Mesopotamia, in other words, pre and at the time of the, of the uh, Tower of Babel, records reveal that the Mesopotamians believed that the planets were on different courses than that of which we know them to be today. Now, every culture which was scattered by the Godhead from the Tower of Babel to every continent of the earth, they all share two things in common memory. Number one, that of a fantastical mythological golden age of harmony and prosperity and all-around well-being, which, number two, they called the golden age. It was catastrophically disrupted by the Great Flood. Now, from the time of the Tower of Babel, they began to think of the pre-flood times as the good old days. Tragically, the leaders and their followers at the Tower of Babel had abandoned the true worship of the one true God, the Godhead, Jehovah, and took from and formed their theology out of lies by Lucifer from the night sky. Now, they abandoned Noah and the theology and relationship with the one true God of the day and of the true light for their false God of the night and its deep, deep theological darkness. Worship of Jehovah God, the theology of the day, is signified by the rainbow. The rainbow is composed of seven basic colors that appear when a ray of sunlight shines through a drop of rain. Light is a symbol for the Holy Spirit the seven spirits of God, and rain, water, is a symbol for God's word. Now, the rainbow is the seal of the, of the uh, Jehovah God's everlasting covenant with mankind and the animals, in which Jehovah God promised that he will never again destroy the earth by means of a great flood. Now, the everlasting covenant is the grace of Jehovah God, in which Jehovah God gives all of mankind the time and the opportunity through his word, by his spirit, to repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Jehovah God has promised not to bring his judgment on the sinful, iniquitous, wicked, and unrepentant mankind until the end of this duration of grace. Now, this is in contrast with the theology of the night, Lucifer, Satan's perversion of the story of God's redemption in the constellation of the stars. Now, this transition from worship of Jehovah God to Lucifer, Satan, wasn't done in one fell swoop. They didn't pitch out the baby with the bathwater all at once. They did it by degrees, as is done today through many secret societies, particularly the Freemasons and the Jesuit priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this deep, dark, false theology and worship of Lucifer, Satan, which is Saturn, was incrementally but emphatically replaced the one true God of Noah, Jehovah, the Godhead of the creation. Now at the heart and center of their night and dark theology is the shared memory of the so-called Golden Age, which has come down to us through the ages as the myth of a sun that the ancients believed that was at the very center of the cosmos that was, according to their thoughts, false theology, the creator of the whole cosmos. This sun they worship is identified to be the planet Saturn. Now they refer to Saturn as the, the best sun in contrast with our sun at the center of our solar system. Today, Saturn is the sixth planet from our sun. In this, our solar system, beginning with our sun at its center, Saturn is the seventh body in our solar system. But according to the Mesopotamian writings, the planet Saturn once held a position in the universe that from the perspective of persons looking at the night sky from planet Earth, Saturn appeared to be the very axis of the universe. But this, the operative word here now, is appeared. 
Now, this was the origin of the zodiac, known by them as the great cosmic wheel that turns on the axle that is Saturn, churning out the names and fates and destinies of individual humans and civilizations from their birth to their death. Noah and his righteousness in his belief and worship of the one true God, Jehovah, was marginalized, then eclipsed, and then forgotten by the hordes of humanity who followed Nimrod, living in the cities that he built and worshiping him and his god, Saturn, from which comes the name Satan. Now, the man Nimrod was the personification of the fallen angel Lucifer, or Satan, in the form of the planet Saturn. So then Lucifer, Satan, Saturn, and Nimrod are all three one in the same in different aspects of their beings. Now, all humanity adhered to the new devious and deceiving false religion that came off the serpent Lucifer's tongue as it is traced from Ham, the son of Noah, to Cush, the son of Ham, to Nimrod, the son of Cush, to Damunzi, later known to the Hebrews as Tammunzi. This false religion was perfected by Samarimus, the wife of Cush, who gave birth to Nimrod, and then, upon her son Nimrod's rise to preeminence and power, married Nimrod, her son, which, upon Nimrod's death, and had her son Damunzi enthroned, whom she publicly claimed she was supernaturally or immaculately impregnated by Nimrod. Now, this was for her private and personal ambition, which was to carry on the family religious enterprise they began and perfected at the Tower of Babel for dominance over the human horde. Now, it might be asked why it was Ham, the third and youngest son of Noah, through whom his, this falling away from Noah's worship of Jehovah God with the institution of Lucifer, Satan, Saturn by Nimrod, and Samarimus. Why Ham? Well, after the great flood, Noah fell into an alcoholic stupor and was naked and uncovered in his tent. Clothing in scripture is a metaphor for order. Noah, being stripped of his clothes, was, in a, was a violation of God's righteousness. In his drunkenness, he abandoned his consciousness to the vagaries of happenstance. That he was uncovered in his tent means that Noah left his wife and family open to fallen angel intrusion and infestation and open to demonic possession. A man's covering is Christ is, as his head. The covering of a wife is her husband. The husband is the head of the wife. As the head of his wife, Noah abandoned that responsibility and left her vulnerable to Lucifer Satan as had Adam left his wife Eve vulnerable in the Garden of Eden. By the way, the same is applicable today now as it was then and with Adam and Eve in the Garden of, as it was with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, it's the same Jehovah God, it's the same devil. Feminism is the proof of the pudding concerning this issue. The devil and demons are having a field day with women and families in the USA. But why? Because we men are naked, having stripped ourselves of our righteous clothing handed down to us from our pilgrim and Puritan fathers who got it from their, the pure doctrines of Scripture. We have left our wives and children uncovered and available to the wiles of the devil. Now Ham was the first of Noah's three sons to find their father in this condition with their mother uncovered and vulnerable to Lucifer from above and demons from below. Rather than gently restore his father to the place of honor due Noah as his father in the spirit of meekness, lest he himself be tempted in, in the same manner as had been Noah, Ham shamed his father to his brothers. Ham chronicled his father's indiscretion in a contemptuous report that trivialized and denigrated his father Noah. He held Noah up to them in shame of derision and dishonor. But his two brothers Shem and Japheth did not receive the report in the manner in which Ham displayed it in ridicule and mockery of Noah. They did not deny the truth that Noah had fallen into a bad way. Instead of entering into agreement with Ham in his report of shaming their father, Shem went to Jehovah God and inquired as to what to do and how to do it. He and Japheth took a sheet, walked backwards, and covered their father, not looking at his indiscretion, but tending to Noah's need to cover him, giving him grace and time and opportunity to recover himself out of the error of his way. 
In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, and James chapter 5, verse 20. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such in, in, uh, as one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. When sobered up, Noah knew what Ham did to him, and Noah cursed Ham's child Canaan. Why Canaan? Why did he not curse Ham, his direct son who had treated him shamefully? The reason Noah did not curse Ham directly, according to Bible teacher Harry Ironsides, is because God had, right after they got off the ark, blessed Ham as he had Noah and the other two sons. Also, God had instructed them to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. It is impossible to curse someone God has blessed. Even though Ham's assessment of Noah's condition was correct, in that he found his father naked and uncovered in his tent in an alcoholic stupor, Ham did not handle the situation in the spirit of mercy and grace, but rather in the spirit of judgment and condemnation. He did not handle the situation in God's way, but by his own rational mind in his own way. Ham personally did not suffer the curse direct, but Ham's family became the object of the devil and demons and that Ham judged, and therefore, according to the universal spiritual principle that Jesus explained to us, when you judge another, the judgment with which you judge, you will be judged. And the measure of judgment you mete out in, to whoever you judge will be measured back to you again, measure for measure. Condemnation by Ham is what happened. And condemnation came back to him. Now this judgment came to Ham in the form of a generational curse in which Noah actually double-cursed Canaan, Ham's last and youngest son. Having accursed Noah for leaving his wife vulnerable to the devil and demons in a spirit of judgment, Noah simply turned the curse back to the head from which it was sent to him, but not direct to Ham because Ham was blessed by God, but indirect to Ham's family. Now the curse came on Ham's family, his first son Cush being the father of Nimrod, who, the Bible explains, led the great falling away from Jehovah God to accept himself, Lucifer, Satan, and Saturn in the place of Jehovah God, receiving worship that belongs to Jehovah God and to Jehovah God alone. Now, further, the curse came not just on Cush, but on Cush's wife, Samarimus, as it would have come on Noah's wife had he remained a drunk in his drunken condition, for which he repented and recovered himself out of the error of his way with the help of his other two sons, Shem and Japheth. In fact, Samarimus was possessed by Lucifer, the very highest of principalities of the fallen angels. He has used her most efficiently to this very day in the deceptions of his heresies to ensnare mankind into his nets of deceit for destruction. Okay then, what is God's way? Ham handled the situation from only his own mind, emotions, and will. He did not consider the mind of Christ or the feelings of anybody except himself. He decided by his own determination to keep in, in keeping with his own personal ambition that his father had disqualified himself from being the head and leader of the family and should be disowned and others, namely himself, should take the exalted place of Noah. Upon awakening from his wine, Noah resumed his patriarchal authority as the spiritual head of his family, and, knowing what his youngest son had done unto him, Noah judged in accordance with his knowledge of the spiritual ramifications of the ordeal. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Noah, a spiritual man, judged from the will of God, not out of his own will. First of all, you have to do the will of God. For, to, for you to do the will of God, you must know the will of God in the situation. Now, you cannot think that you know it. You must know that you know it. It must be confirmed that you know it. 
This is where we seek the counsel of others who are themselves known to be godly spiritual persons. The Bible will reveal God's will and God will confirm his will in any situation in which he is sought by those earnestly seeking God's will. Now, this is what the foundation does for us. The foundation is the basis on which we who have the Spirit of God judge all things by the revealed Word of God in the spirit and intent of his Word, yet we are judged of no man. Now, Jesus told the woman at the well, John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, The true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is the way Shem and Japheth judged the situation. They did not receive the report from Ham in the same spirit and same motivations as Ham had reported it. Ham was dealing with the situation in the same way as had Cain dealt with his situation. He did it in his own way. Cain let his ambitions and feelings overwhelm him when he found out that he was rejected by Jehovah God, and his offering was rejected by Jehovah God. Now, Cain was so bent out of shape that by the situation that he simply would not permit even Jehovah God to lead him out of the quigmire of depression. His state of anger turned inward, in which he permitted transgression against Jehovah God's word to enter his thinking, and eventually outward in his speaking and into his action by murdering his brother Abel. Now, the two, Cain and Ham, have very different outward elements in their situations, but at their core, they share the very same situation. They both are rejected. Cain by Jehovah God and later by all of human society after his mother, uh, murder of Abel, and Ham was rejected by his father Noah and later by Jehovah God, after Ham's grandson Nimrod, and with his wife Samarimus, led all of humanity into the sins of Lucifer Satan at the Tower of Babel. Now, there is another issue involved that concerns Ham's personal ambition through the Bible, though the Bible does not speak of it. The book of Jasher tells us that Noah was in possession of the special clothes of skins with which Jehovah God had clothed Adam and Eve before he sent them out of the garden. Now, these clothes had been handed down from godly patriarchs, generation to generation. These clothes imparted special authority to the one who owned or wore them. It's interesting that the whole ordeal of Noah's drunkenness involves not just the intoxication by wine, but clothes, or rather the lack of clothing, resulting in Noah's nakedness. Now, Jaser says that the clothes were on the ark and that Ham stole them before they left from the ark. Such an act would reveal Ham's ambition to be the authority in the place of Noah, and his willingness to steal them reveals the intensity of, of his desire to hold such a position over his brethren and their families. Now, having stolen these clothes and finding Noah, the head and the leader of the family was uh, uh, drunk and stripped to nakedness, leaving him and the family uncovered, did Ham see this as his opportunity to make his grab for power? Noah's nakedness was the perfect event which Ham could and did seize upon to mock, shame, and condemn his father as the basis on which he, having stolen the clothes of authority, could assume the authority in Noah's place. This revealed Ham to be the perfect candidate to the serpent as the seed of the serpent, for the serpent to gain access and assert himself again into the human family on this side of the great flood. Now, I contend that this, the specter of the serpent once again operating in humanity, was Noah's primary concern in his curse on Canaan. So again, the question, why Canaan? Why not Ham? That the curse came from Noah means that Noah understood perfectly by Ham's response and subsequent action of casting shame and condemnation on him that he was a carrier of the Cain way of doing things and that it was Cain's way which was cursed by Jehovah God which opened humanity up for the serpent, Satan, the devil to invade the human genome, utterly ruining all humans at the DNA level for which Jehovah God brought the great flood. Now Ham's yielding to the serpent's temptations 
identified him and his progeny to be the serpent's best option to become Satan's synagogue on this side of the great flood. By the way, that's the same as the unbelieving Jews and Hebrew children who, at Jesus' first coming, reject Jesus as God's Messiah and the Son of the living God. Now these unbelieving Jews and Hebrews are carriers of the Antichrist spirit. They are the synagogue of Satan about which the Spirit of God tells us in Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 and Revelation chapter 3 verse 9. The Jews and Hebrews' rejection of Christ coming in the flesh and blood person of Jesus identifies them to Lucifer Satan as the perfect channel through which to reveal Antichrist to the world in his globalist New World Order kingdom of darkness. Now, on the other side of the Great Flood, it was through the Cain line of descendants that the Luciferian and fallen angel infection found its way into the social fabric of the human family. Lucifer seized on Cain through Cain's pride and Cain's own inner anger that his, Cain's half-truths, made Cain unacceptable to Jehovah God as a person, and Cain's offering, which was an expression of Cain's half-truth, was unacceptable to Jehovah God, and so both Cain and his offering were rejected by Jehovah God. In like manner, on this side of the great flood, Ham revealed himself to be the serpent's channel back into mankind. Now, what is meant by the phrase half-truth? Cain's offering tells that story. Cain brought an offering of fruit from the cursed ground that reflected only the part of the curse by Jehovah God on Adam that the cursed ground would bring forth thorns and thistles and that he would return to the ground, meaning he would die and his body decay and disintegrate into the dust from which Jehovah God had created him. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. But Cain was rejecting the last part of the curse, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now Cain, by the sweat of his brow, grubbed from this cursed ground, now infested with thorns and thistles, his necessary food. Notice here that the brow is the forehead. It is in the forehead that many take the mark of the beast, Antichrist, identifying themselves with him in Cain's theology of he being his own savior and his salvation by his own work. Contrast to this is those of us who are Christians, who are sealed in our foreheads by the Holy Spirit of God, not for our works, but for our belief in the word of God and obedience and submission to the Holy Spirit of God. Now the Bible tells us what thorns are. Matthew chapter 13 verse 22, Mark chapter 14, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 4 verses 18 through 19, and Luke chapter 8 verse 14. We glean from the synoptic gospels exactly what is meant by thorns. Matthew chapter 18 verse uh, 22, excuse me, Matthew chapter 13 verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Mark chapter 4 verses 18 and 19. And these are they which are sown among thorns such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Luke Chapter 8, verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring, to no, no, fruit, and bring no fruit to perfection. So you have four things. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things, and pleasures of this life. Now what this tells us is that Cain went about his uh, farming with single-eyed commitment, not fooling himself about his daunting tasks, nor permitting his passions to dictate his time and efforts, nor allowing himself to indulge in pleasures that would sap his time and energy. 
and he was very proud of his accomplishment. Now, thistles in scripture are a metaphor for interpersonal relationships and in the far reaches are national and international relationships. The thistle that stuck into Cain was his encounter with his brother Abel in the field. It is a metaphor for the world. Cain still insisted that his way, his half-truth, was the right way and that Jehovah God and his brother Abel were wrong. Abel, whose name means breath or vanity or transistory or vapor, of which the Bible tells us our life is a breath, vanity, it is transistory, it is a vapor, here today and gone tomorrow. James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Go to now, ye that say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Abel could not convince Cain that the promise of Jehovah God to Eve that her seed would crush the serpent's head by means of a blood and death sacrifice that is required by Jehovah God to satisfy his holiness to restore humanity's access to the tree of life by which everyone who wants to please Jehovah God and seeks immortality must come by this way. Blood and death sacrifice by an innocent victim. Now, Cain was blinded by his pride. He was still seething inside from his initial rejection of his person and rejection of his offering by Jehovah God. Instead of doing well, as Jehovah God had counseled him, by humbling himself and accepting the truth, not just half of the truth, but the whole of the truth, he stubbornly held to his half-truth, which, being a half-truth, made it be a whole lie. Now, incapable of striking at Jehovah God, Cain struck what he could see and touch his brother. He lashed out and struck Abel with a fatal blow. Now, overcoming the thorns was no minor feat, but Cain's offering reflected the fact that Cain had not considered that that overcoming pertained to temporal existence only. Battling overwhelming thorny obstacles, he became a successful farmer, but he had not accepted the fact of death as the ultimate end for all of mankind, and therefore, he was presenting a half-truth and rejecting the full truth that man would within a day of his life, within Jehovah's day of 1,000 years. He would die, and he would return to the dust from which Jehovah God had made humankind. Now Cain's presumption was that by his works of overcoming thorns to coach the ground to yield to him her bounty qualified him to lead the way to the re-enter the Garden of Eden and partake of the Tree of Life that is the source of immortality, eternal life, thereby evading or avoiding the judgment of death by Jehovah God. Jehovah God's rejection of Cain and his offering and the acceptance by Jehovah God of his brother Abel and Abel's offering of dead sheep was a shock that caused Cain to go into a depression, meaning anger turned inward. Now what Cain referred, refused to acknowledge was that this ordeal was a precursor of what he and all of us face upon the event of our own death. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, it is appointed men once to die, but after this the judgment, which is the judgment of acceptance or rejection by Jesus based on our acceptance or rejection of the totality of the gospel by and in the right spirit of which the foundation is the integral part that reveals the acceptable will of God. Now, we who are Christian Protestants are facing this same half-truth ordeal today in the Roman Catholic Vatican's ecumenical movement bidding us to ignore and dismiss our assessment of Roman Catholicism as pagan worship in the guise of Christianity, and beckoning, uh, beckoning us to end the Protestant movement and rejoin them in brotherly love at the expense of the saving and sanctifying truth of the gospel. Now, the Roman Catholic Pope and Protestant Christian leaders, rather misleaders and harlots, quote the prayer of Jesus, John chapter 17, verse 21, that they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, 
that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now this is a half-truth by them, in that their ecumenical movement, unity, they espouse, rejects the prior and preceding part of Jesus' prayer, John chapter 17, verses 17 through 19. Jesus prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy truth, not the Roman Catholic Pope's word and say so, which he has declared, and the Roman Catholic Church upholds as above and superior to the inerrant word of God, the Christian Bible. Now Jesus continued praying. Verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now, God does not permit any to go on into unity in his name until those of us who will go on into to unity in Christ Jesus are founded in the saving and sanctifying truth of the foundation by which we prove the good, acceptable, and then are permitted to go on to the perfect will of God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John reveal the good will of God. That's his provision of salvation in the rock of Jesus Christ. Paul's writings, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, reveal the acceptable will of God. Provision of sanctification by the Holy Spirit, by the doctrine of the foundation. Revelation chapter 1 verses 10 through 18 reveal the perfect will of God, presenting Jesus, God's Christ, and the Son of the living God as he is, the complete and whole Jesus, the person of truth. The person of truth. True church. It doesn't exist anywhere today except in small pockets of individuals who meet with each other in Christ's name. All of these organized religions have bastardized the teachings of Christ, have corrupted the teachings of Jesus, and most of them are helping to lead you into slavery in the New World Order. In those days, great signs and wonders were performed as God confirmed His Word with signs following. True Christianity, ladies and gentlemen, anointed by the Holy Spirit, swept the world like a prairie fire. Nothing could stop it. No matter how many Christians the Emperor crucified, no matter how many Christians were thrown to the animals in the Roman circus, one hundred fold sprang up to take their place. This movement encircled the mountains and crossed the oceans. It made kings tremble and tyrants fearful. It was said of those early Christians that they had turned the world literally upside down. So powerful was their message and spirit. Now I am talking about the true Christian teachings of Jesus Christ and the way that it was followed in the early days of Christ's church, not Rome's church, not Baptist's church, not Lutheran's church, not Orthodox church but Christ's church. Before too many years had passed, men began to set themselves up as lords over God's people in places of the Holy Spirit instead of conquering by spiritual means and by truth, by truth, not too many people in the world understand what truth even means today. As in the early days, men began to substitute their ideas and their methods in place of the teachings that Christ gave us. The Inquisition came from these people, not from Jesus Christ. The Crusades came from these people, not from Jesus Christ. Attempts to merge paganism and Christianity were being made even in the days when our New Testament was being written, folks. For Paul mentioned that the mystery of iniquity was already at work. Already at work. And he warned that there would come a falling away and some would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The counterfeit doctrines of the pagans. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And by the time that Jude wrote the book that bears his name, it was necessary for him to exhort the people to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For certain men had crept in who were attempting to substitute things that were no part of the original faith. Check Jude, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Christianity, folks, came face to face with the Babylonian paganism in its various forms that had been established in the Roman Empire. The early Christians refused to have anything to do with its customs and beliefs. We all know what happened. Much persecution resulted. Many, many Christians were falsely accused, thrown to the lions, burned at the stake, and in other ways tortured and martyred. 
and for their own safety, they went underground in the catacombs and in the caves, and they formed their own secret society, which was known then as the Friendly Open Secret Society, and their symbol to mark their way was a fish. Then, great changes began to be made. The Emperor of Rome professed conversion to Christianity. He had to. For Rome, Rome would have fallen just as sure, just as sure, as the tree in the forest falls to the axe, if he had not made that move. In those early days of the real church, the real church, Christ's church, who practiced exactly what he taught them, great, great changes began to take place that have affected us right up to this very day. What a shock it must have been when Constantine professed a conversion to Christianity after stating that he had seen the vision of the cross in the sky. And some accounts say that he didn't see it in the sky during daylight, but he saw it in a dream. And ladies and gentlemen, because he never accepted Christ during his entire life, and in fact was a pagan sun worshiper, I question whether he ever saw a cross at all. You see, because history says and records very clearly Constantine never accepted Christ as his Savior. He never really followed the teachings of Christ. He was, in fact, a sun worshiper. He practiced the mystery religion of Babylon. But he was, in fact, the Emperor of Rome. Rome very quickly became, ladies and gentlemen, the Catholic Church, and the Roman Emperor became the Pope. He had to do this to save the Empire. The symbol of the Roman Empire and the Emperor was the double-headed eagle it signified that he ruled over both the East and the West, that the sun did not set on the Roman Empire. This symbol still is displayed upon the walls of the Vatican, and just recently, Russia adopted this symbol as its national symbol. It is the symbol of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. And I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, but hopefully you get the point. Imperial orders, ladies and gentlemen, went forth throughout the Roman Empire that persecutions should cease simply and quickly ceased. Bishops were created and given high honors. The church began to receive worldly recognition and power. But for all of this, a great, great price had to be paid. Many, many compromises were made, ladies and gentlemen, with paganism. Instead of the church being separate from the world, it became a part of this world system. The emperor, showing favor, demanded a place of leadership in the church. For in paganism, emperors were believed to be gods. So from here on, wholesale mixtures of paganism into Christianity were made, especially at Rome. We believe the, the, the information that you're going to receive and have received, in fact, over this broadcast will convince you that what is known today as the Roman Catholic Church is nothing less than the old Roman Empire transformed and the old Roman pantheon of gods became the pantheon of saints. When Jesus spoke to a crowd and someone walked away from the crowd, he did not chase them down the road and try to stuff his teachings down their throat, ladies and gentlemen. He did not do that. Neither did he build great, wealthy cathedrals built of shining glass with great pageants on the holidays and big-name stars to come and sing and perform in these pageants where a homeless person or a poor, unemployed man with dirty clothes would be turned away from the door. Jesus Christ would have been the first one who welcomed that person into the church. And if you will look at the people that he habitually associated with, whose homes he slept in, who became his disciples, you will understand that those today who call themselves Christians do not even know the meaning of the word. Now the word foundation has come to mean whatever it is the person using the word wants it to mean, and it, it has come to stand for nothing. It is the scriptural foundation that is missing with uh, Christian Protestant denominations, putting for a foundation their own self-devised bricks of creed and mortar of screed. Now that's the Lutheran, the Reformed, the Anabaptist, the Anglican, the Episcopal, Presbyterian, Amish, Mennonite, Quaker, Congregational, Baptist, Methodist, Apostolic, uh, Pentecostal, Charismatic, and on and on and on. 33,000 different sects, each with its man-made bricks of creed and slime from order screeds. In the place of the true and genuine foundation doctrine of the Christian faith as taught by the seven spirits of God in the seven absolute no compromise, non-negotiable doctrines of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, which word means maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, and of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. There are blessings that you cannot receive.
Cain's failure to accept the full curse left him unprepared for the totality of the curse, the judgment that his whole life, no matter how successful in time, had been spent in vain. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all of his labor, which he taketh under the sun? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Cain had failed to learn one of the true lessons of the curse, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Now, it was tampering with the word of God that, Eve sedu that God Eve seduced by the serpent, and it was receiving that tampered word that was a lie, as if it was the truth that got Adamic man the curse of death. Now, the Roman Catholic Church Vatican Ecumenical Movement is based on a lie. Now, I want to pause here and point out that Jehovah God's rejection of Cain is the same rejection that they who come to Jesus to enter into the kingdom of heaven, having carried on their lives and ministry without the acceptable foundation, suffer the same rejection. Jesus declaring to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Imagine their shock. Think about some of the giants of Christendom, and especially those who are now running after the Roman Catholic Vatican ecumenical bandwagon is racing headlong into this era of a one-world religion that is based on a Freemason witchcraft 33rd degree ritual that will deliver them to the big mistake for which Jesus says to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Now, it merits repeating. The Roman Catholic Vatican Ecumenical Movement is based squarely on a Freemasonry 33rd degree ritual. This 33rd degree Freemasonry ritual is a witchcraft ritual. This 33rd degree Freemason ritual necessitates a prominent and respected religious leader and a prominent and respected political leader to conduct the ritual. Now, this is the counterfeit of the true body of Christ's unity in which we who are the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ are unified squarely on the basis of the foundation, the absolute, no compromise, non-negotiable doctrines of the Christian faith. Now, we who are Christians are being made to be, by the blood of Jesus Christ, kings and priests by Jesus, both offices united together in each one of us as is unified together in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, in the 33rd degree Freemasonry ecumenical witchcraft ritual, the king, the prominent political leader, and the priest, the prominent religious leader, cooperate together by subduing religious doctrines and political nationalities in the interest of a globalist unified kingdom based on brotherly love that transcends national borders and religious truth of the Bible. Now this is a counterfeit of the Christian body of Christ unity in which we, the nation in which we reside by the doctrine of the Christian faith, reveal Jesus as the person of truth. Revelation chapter 1 verses 10 through 18. Now, the person or person being initiated into the, in the course of the 33rd degree Freemason witchcraft ritual presents his religious doctrine of whatever his religious affiliation, and he places it on an altar, be it the Christian Bible, the Hebrew Torah, the Islam Quran, the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, the Confucius Tao, the Buddha text, or any other. The initiate or initiates then kiss these many several different religious materials which demonstrates their acceptance of all of them on an equal basis. Now, in reality, 
this kiss is the kiss of Judas, the kiss of betrayal to Jesus Christ and denial of Jesus as the only begotten Son of God of the living God. Now, leaving these religious materials there on the altar, then they rise up together and join together in one harmonious group hug and brotherly love. And in reality, what is actually happening here is that this is a setup for the revelation of Antichrist as the embodiment of the person of perfection of all of these different religions. Now, he presents himself as that one and, and at the same time, both king and priest over his globalist kingdom into which all who receive him are initiated by reception of his mark, 666, in their right hand or in their forehead. Now, if you are a Christian, whether you be Protestant or Catholic, do you believe that the Hebrew Torah without the New Testament, the Islamic Quran, the Hindi Bhagavad Gita, the Confucius Tao, the Buddhist text, and any other religious materials are on an equal par with the Christian Bible of the Old and New Testaments? If you say no to that, then are you ready and willing to take that stand and come out of her, my people, as this ecumenical Roman Catholic Vatican juggernaut rolls on down the wide path and broad way to destruction with Antichrist? Now, do you, if you are a Christian, believe that the Antichrist of the absent Hebrews and Jews, Muhammad and the Mahdi of the Islamics, Hare Krishna of the Hindus, Confucius of the Chinese, and Buddha of the Buddhist are on an equal par as saviors with Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God? Now, if you say no to that, then will you hold fast to Jesus' name in the face of the strong delusion that is coming as Antichrist is revealed and claims to be the true and genuine Christ, the very embodiment of all of these religious saviors, saviors of all time? These are the questions of this hour in our generations. Now, as regards to Cain, it is this half-truth that Lucifer uses so effectively in his many and varied versions of this false religion that, he, that has its origin in the serpent's lies and its stronghold by the original sin by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and manifested in and through Cain outside the Garden of Eden, which appeared so evident to Noah in his ordeal that it was manifesting in Ham and his progeny on this side of the Great Flood. Now on the other side of the Great Flood, the fallen angels got their grip through the Cain line of humans, and by the time of the Great Flood, every single person existing had been and was infected by the fallen angel corruption that had marred the image of Jehovah God, man's body, his very DNA corrupted, so that therefore mankind, with the exception of Noah, his three sons and their wives, had disqualified themselves and their image of Jehovah was so totally ruined so that they could not be brought into the likeness of Jehovah God. In fact, they had become in the likeness of the serpent, the beast. Now, we are all made in the image of the Godhead. Our Creator Father endowed us with His image in that He created us a physical, uh, a physical a, He created us physical with a body, gave us a soul, which is our mind, emotions, and will, and breathed into us a spirit the vehicle by which we are enabled to relate to Jehovah God and communicate with Him and have fellowship with Him. The body is made to function in this, what the Bible calls first heaven, what the physicists call the third dimension. He gave us a soul, which are, is our mind, our emotions, and will, for the purpose of relating to our physical dimension and as a source between our spirit and relationship to our physical dimension. Now, when our spirit is in direct relationship with the Holy Spirit of God and we obey Him, we live in His will. Being in His will, we can function in accordance with His plan for our lives as He reveals this to us from the Word of God. Now, that is not a trite or pithy saying. Jehovah God has a very specific purpose for each and every one of us who are His with a plan for our lives. Now, nobody else can fulfill the specific and particular purpose for which the God has, has, has created you. And that plan and purpose cannot be known by the mind alone. You can't figure it out on your own. 
It has to be revealed to you, to your soul, by means of your spirit in contact and under submission to his spirit as he renews your mind by his word. And you can know that where Jehovah God guides, he provides, which is not a pithy statement. And also, what Jehovah God wills, he pays the bills. that he meant well but I pray for his disciples lest they wind up in hell and I'm sure that old Mohammed thought he knew the way but it won't be Hare Krishna we stand before on the judgment day no it won't be old Buddha that's sitting on the throne and it of the mind It won't save your soul No, it won't be old Buddha that's sitting on the throne And it won't be old Muhammad that's calling us home And it won't be Hare Krishna that plays that trumpet too And we're going to see the sun And still die in your sin You can't even be charismatic you Shout and dance and jump a pew But if you hate your brother You won't be one 